final minute, ball comes to you. Not only do you win the World Cup, you do it in the most fairy tale of settings. I look at it as a five-year-old child. What are they doing constantly? Dreaming. Kicking a ball in my driveway. Three, two, one, to win the match. And then it's happening. Making the most of your life just comes down to your desires. And the more energy you have for what you want, the more things will come up to serve it. Where there is great focused intention, there can be manifestation of dreams. It's boundless. I've just written a book on happiness. In that book, I say your dreams won't make you happy. If I look at your life, and from what I can see, by the age of 24, you have achieved your dreams. You know, you've won the World Cup. But immediately afterwards, I've heard you talk about this deep, lonely sense of emptiness that started to creep in, and that continued. So when I say that phrase, your dreams won't make you happy, what comes up for you? I think, first of all, you almost clarified it for me in that realizing your dreams won't make you happy. But actually, I find dreaming itself amazingly powerful, you know, having dreams and, and exploring what it is you desire in life. I think exploring it and, and conjuring up the excitement and the passion and, and enjoy I, that I find amazing, but you're right. The dream itself, when realized the physical manifestation of it, there's nothing there, but there's, it's almost like the reverse. People would think there's got to be substance in the actual thing, but there's more substance in the idea of the thing when you're on your way to it than there is in the actual thing. And I think for me, it was fairy tale and it was amazing and it couldn't have happened. It's ridiculous in a way that I might have sat in my driveway or, or sat in the garden rather than, or been kicking a ball in my driveway. And my brother and I would do this all the time. Oh, and it's back to me, three, two, one, to win the match. You know, you do this over and over again, whether it was basketball, but mostly it was rugby. And then it's happening. It's what someone else is saying about you. It's, it's ludicrous how these things plan out. And the process of dreaming and and creating that idea and and then bringing it about. That's such an amazing process. And I've sort of mentioned this before that what I think I had in a space that didn't help was that th that creative process is what you celebrate as your power. But when you get attached to what you actually create and not the process, you find there's nothing there. And that's what happened to me, you know, I, I was sure that that was the Hollywood ending to my life and it was going to be the happy ever after. But the realization came very quickly that there was nothing there. And the, the also, the, by when I was young, I set my goal so high. I set the bar as high as I possibly could. And having that almost sense of infinite about what I was dreaming about was so powerful. But then to realize it, I then immediately started to try and kick into the next one, which was, we're going to win the next World Cup. Which, why wouldn't that feel as good as winning the first one? Because it's winning a World Cup, you know, it's, it should feel the same. But almost having the bar was now not quite as high. And also I had this understanding deep down, although I wasn't ready to process it or fully comprehend it, that the answer wasn't going to be there either. It wasn't going to be in whatever I was searching for. I had to... I had to have a different relationship with myself and with life because I'd almost unfortunately proved something to myself at that point, which was going to make life more complex in the short term for me. Um, because it was much easier being able to just to say, all I need to do is set myself a goal and then life's good. Yeah. There's, there's a, there's a deeper element to it. What was that feeling like the morning after? when you open your eyes and that realization creeps in, that awareness that, you know, I've won the World Cup, but I also don't feel great. Um, and the reason I want to really go there, Johnny, is because I think there's so many kids, so many adults in society who would look at your story from the outside and many other stories of in inverted commas, success, and feel, yeah, when I get that, life's going to be good, I'm going to be happy. <laughs> yeah. And I think when we look at people like yourself, who in some ways kind of showcase the extremes of life, because 
I reckon there's thousands, tens of thousands of kids who this spring and summer in the UK will be in their back gardens and will be recreating that scenario. Yeah. And how many of them actually does that happen to in reality? Well, <laughs> one form of reality. <laughs> yeah. Right, very few. So I really want to understand and help everyone else understand what does that feel like? What what is that emptiness? Can you can you describe it? Yeah, I think the the first point is is for me is comes to mind is the idea about setting a goal and bringing about stuff in life and having your your creative hand in that realization and that manifesting of amazing things that's for me a huge point of why we're here to explore it what am i that's my power so i want to explore my power to to make things happen to be able to create this internal um reality and then how do i turn that into an external reality that's the creative process i'm i i sort of form it here and then i form it there and, and understanding how, that link and how it works that's that's amazing but your worth is in the internal part not in the external part and that that i think is when you say the emptiness that's that's the issue it's not with going out there and saying this is my dream i want to make it happen it's like brilliant but just the idea that i'm going to find something in the thing that's going to make me more and i think that's the the issue that part of understanding that creative process for me has been it starts with realizing i have everything already and if I'm feeling like I don't, that's blocking my creative process. If I, I'm already enough, I'm already perfect. Nothing that, that's out there is going to fill me or or complete me in a way or make me more worthy. And that was what was behind a lot of this. At the beginning, when, as a child, the idea was I want to win a World Cup final because it's it was a celebration of who I am and my talent. As I got older... I want to win a World Cup final because it will make me someone. And that was the, it will make me something or someone. And, and in that way is that I'm, an, I'm a nobody and I need to be a someone. Whereas a child, you're a nobody and you love being a nobody. You don't even know you're a nobody because that's what allows you to be everything you want to be. So in this moment, you can be fully being this and then you can be fully being a, an astronaut and then you're a prince and so you can be everything. But as a, when you get this idea about who I am, suddenly you can be that, but you, you're trying to be that. And you, that trying is not part of the creative process for me. The, the true creative process is effortless. And I was trying desperately, it was so need fueled to win that World Cup, was obsessive because there was something there which was going to make me who I was meant to be. And the big emptiness was one, first of all, the come down from the emotional, you know, uh, I think people speak about traumas as always, they're always kind of negative, but an emotional high like that is a shock to the system. So you've got that sort of chemical, I guess, I don't know what you call it, almost like a mix that you've got to clear. And next morning you feel like you're hung over. So you've already got that feeling of like, I'm not physically feeling in that wow moment. I'm already a little bit down and low. Um, and then you look around and the emptiness is, you feel like you've been let down on a big promise, just a massive promise. And you feel like you've been betrayed a little bit, but there's still this hope in you that it's coming. Yeah. I said, don't worry, this is just a, a blip. Once you get out the door, get outside or, or just get moving, it's going to come. But sure enough, it doesn't. And I think it's so complex to understand that for me, it's just arriving when you're on your way somewhere. And to use a an analogy that really works for me, it's a bit like, it's a bit like, I don't, I'm not quite sure I found what it is for me. When I was a child, it used to be um, trainers and it used to be computer games, but something that when you, that you used to think this is my thing. So for some people it's cars. Or whatever so i use the example of a car garage you imagine you went into a car garage and in that car garage there's an infinite number of cars and you know that in your pockets you have enough money to buy any of them and so you're walking around that car garage and there's infinite number and it's the best feeling because you look at each one and you're like i could have this 
and you just want to oh, try it and you think, whoa, and you spend as much time as you can and then you come to realize that's what I want. So you pay your money, you get in it, and as soon as you get in it, you think this is amazing, but it's not as good as just a moment ago when I hadn't made my decision. And that's what it was to me. Because when you get in that car and you drive it out and you see someone else walking into the show garage with the pockets full, you're thinking, I wish I was you. I want to be free like you. I've made my choice. And then to carry on the analogy, you drive it round and you get to the idea that this is my car now for life. And as it gets older and becomes a bit less in comparison to others, you start feeling like I'm now, yeah, it's not as good. And then you want to put new spoiler on it to try and vamp it up, to try and compete again. But you know that it's not changing the real deal, which is on the inside. And then you realize that the whole point for me was the understanding was that you never leave the garage. You're always in the garage. Or another way of looking at it is that you never your pockets refill straight away. You only ever test drive that idea of who you are. But once you get stuck in it, that's what it felt like to me. I'm going to become someone. This is my guy. This is who I am. I'm a rugby player and I'm going to win. But all I wanted to be was free again. I wanted to be that childlike thing about realizing that I'm not stuck in this. I've got this ability to choose who and how I want to be in every moment brand new. I haven't spent my money. I haven't made my choice. I'm not held to this idea it's just an idea and learning that that idea can be lifted off like the rugby shirt this is who i am right now because it helps me take it off i'm free i feel amazing how do i enjoy this next moment well what is it i want to achieve what's a right shirt back in the car garage that's perfect for this moment bang well it connects me to my goals but the problem is we keep that shirt on because we can't take it off because we feel like if we take it off we're a nobody but actually it's in taking it off we realize oh This gives me back my choice. It allows me to play with the idea of who I am. Whereas, of course, in society, that comes with a bit of a stigma. You know, the idea that you change, it's it's charlatan. It's But actually, the ability to take off shirts and choose is what allows you to go from one business meeting as all you are, and whatever happens in that meeting, if you've got another one straight after, as you walk in and you're, you're fully present for that one. Yeah. But if you're not, whatever you carry from the first one, because it's a stain on the shirt, you take into the next one. And by the end of the day, your shirt's torn to bits. So you recover it as best as you can when you're sleeping and the next day, but it's still marked. And that's what aging is. That's what all this trauma is. It's this idea this shirt is, is a bit broken. But so this is what I had as my idea at the end of life was I was going to show this. This is who I am. This is, the, this is my life right here. And so every failure was, was a stain I couldn't get out. And it felt so painful because it was, and then people's like saying, you you can't change the past. For me, it was a reinforcement of how terrible it was, as opposed to the idea of trying to help you let go. Actually, the understanding has been for me that in any moment, you're never wearing a shirt. Like I said, you never leave the car garage. It's an idea of a shirt that helps you engage fully yeah. according to the, the what you want to create but once you got stick, get stuck to the shirt once you get stuck to your creation from then on in you start talking about things like pressure like expectation like stress because you've got to try and keep that shirt alive you know someone takes that shirt from you as a rugby player you get injured you feel like someone's trying to rip that shirt off you, you can no longer play you're saying please i'll do anything to keep it but whilst you're wearing it, it feels tight. You can't grow. You can't expand. And I think taking the shirt off is a natural understanding. Letting go of those old ideas is the freedom that I always yeah. wanted. You know, I see as I study your life, as I listen to conversations you have had over the past few years, I actually see many similarities in the mindsets that I have had in the past, the relationship I have had with myself, I see so many similarities and I I feel like all of us, they can be played out in many different ways. So on the outside, they can look quite different. But actually on the inside, I, I know for much of my life, I felt there's a deep hole. And actually, if I achieve, if I get good grades, if I do this, oh, I'm going to feel good. And from the outside, I've had a life of huge success. But much of that success has come with a real emptiness. Yeah. And in some ways, 
and this is the challenge I have, is do we need to go to these extremes to realize those dreams that we thought were going to make us happy to realize, oh, oh, the next day you wake up and what now? Yeah. Like, you know, the sun still rises, the kids still need feeding before school, then it gets to the bus stop. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I mean, in your experience, can people learn these ideas and these messages without going through it? Yeah, I think some of the quickest routes come when you've got no other choice because you've exhausted. And, and I hear about this in the spiritual side, people talking about exhausting the seeker to the point where there's nothing left. So that's surrender. Yeah. So you can surrender, but if you if the, the seeker in you that's looking, like you said, for that extra thing and whatever it is, is so tired, they just fall away. What's left is the clarity that, uh, you know, that what you're looking for is actually where you're looking from. And I think that there needs to be some kind of, I think, challenge involved, definitely. The, the fact is, for me, I think, is that there's lots of challenges taking place all the time that we're not noticing. And there's opportunity in all of those. But what we do is wait for the one that we can't step out the way of the one that that hammers you and there's no way you're not going to be noticing that because it, it's it's so strong but actually the more consciously aware we become in our days the more we can we can tune into where there's essentially resistance so when it comes to that internal side for me the understanding i have that within when there's challenge there's only ever one answer and that's to let go of something. It's never to add something. Where there's resistance, the resistance is because there's something in the way resisting. This is life and this is what's saying, <clears throat> this is the way life is and this is something saying, this is not the way it should be. When the not the way it should be falls away, we become one with life. When we try and add more resistance, thinking that that's somehow going to sort the conflict out, it doesn't work. It's like waging war upon something, thinking there's going to be a conquering. It doesn't happen. Life's not going to give in. Life's going to keep being all it can be. And whilst we continue to come out, have an idea of an idea of who we are, that's going to get in the way of who we really are. Yeah. And that's the conflict. And I think there's so many challenges going on all the time if we're interested in them. That And so much of this is, I think, for me, I've become a bit more sensitive to the subtle things that are going on the subtle sensations the moments of kind of when you're getting triggered but it's not just the trigger where you're shaking and you're panicking it's the trigger when you're you're in that space of realizing basically this is the kind of internal environment i need i understand that i want to set because out of it is inspired all these incredible surprises of life intuition inspiration um, revelation all this kind of stuff and this is the environment i want to set but i'm not setting it right now because this isn't how i want to feel yeah. so who is setting it it's an old version of me that's got an idea there's your opportunity and so it can be as subtle as just saying how am i right now and it's an unfulfilling idea to us to a self who thinks there's going to be an answer because the answer is the answer is not a sort of a response to the question it's the burning away of the question yeah that's the answer and the way that i see it is that you have your energy of your energy at the base of you and then that leads to how you see the world comes out of that energy how you see the world out of that comes how you feel about it out of how you feel about it comes how you think and out of those things comes what you do and of course out of what you do feel and think comes what you create and until we change that energy nothing else will change and yet we mess around with the latter stages of the chain almost trying to i guess instead of switching the pump off we're down at the bottom end trying to yeah. push the water back and i think once you become more interested in your energy rather than your ideas about who you are and what yeah. so i'm going to do something different but that's that's only going to last for so long unless you change your energy so for me it's it's become a case of 
what's my energy? How do I want it to be? And is it, and once it becomes peaceful, quiet, compassionate, gentle excitement, and, and, and in that space of restfulness, then that's how I want to approach everything. There's a clarity within that. And sometimes I'll go and I'll feel like my energy will just trigger and I'll be with some, some of the guys I'm coaching and there'll be a real excitement. And I'll know that if I place myself in that energy I want to be, when I get lifted up to an excitement, I know it's in response to who I'm with. And it's a meeting. It's like a, a real inspired energy as opposed to that, that kind of, I guess, frantic energy that can come with you, that needy energy that needs something, needs things to be a certain way, that needs reassurance. And I've lived a, a lot in that energy. And what I tried to do was reassure that energy, thinking that somehow by what I was doing and change and trying to think differently would somehow change the energy. But it was the energy that was making me think. Yeah. You can't, as Einstein said, you can't, you can't sort of uh, solve a problem with the same mind that created it same way that nothing's going to change until you, you get to that more subtle level. And that subtle level is where all the opportunity is because it's boundless. How would you even define energy for someone who feels, I kind of like what you're saying, Johnny, but I don't quite get it. What do you mean, my energy? I would say, from my perspective, what do I mean about energy? is It's, it's not something you can think about because once you're thinking, you're down that end of the chain. It's about probably the closest you can get to it for me for me the most obvious way is feeling so you understand that the most direct link i feel is is how you see the world and how you feel are closer to that end of the chain than than i think thinking and doing and and that side of and what's basically outcomes in your life so head that way so become more interested in how am i seeing things and how am i feeling right now that's moving in that direction. And as you explore into that direction, it's taking you towards energy. Getting towards that energy for me is represented in worthiness and sort of loving, peaceful silence. You're in that area as a base. Whereas from as you move down to seeing the world, this becomes a sort of judgment side. For me, it's a case of moving that way in the chain back towards being through getting more interested in feeling and becoming more um, aware of how I'm seeing things rather than setting those in stone. This is how the world is rather than this is how I'm seeing it. Yeah. This is what someone's done to me, not this is how I'm feeling, which then he leads you with. So this is what I'm going to do about it. And that's all reactive. So yeah. getting to that idea that just like we said about old ideas that are fixed, it's a case of saying, well, unfixing them is simply a case of realizing, as we said, there is no truth to anything. Yeah, There is a reality that comes from the energy system. And when energy changes, the reality changes. And, you know, for example, a way of looking at that for me is saying, I could look at, I had a four year period in the middle of my career where I was pretty much injured the whole time. And um, in a certain energy system, in an energy, energy state, state of being, I'll sit there and I'll, a thought will come up. Oh, yeah, imagine if I hadn't been injured, I could have played 15 more games. I might be the most capped player ever. And I might have the most points ever. I could, no one could, you know, and, and what a waste of time. The world was against me. And how, how does that happen? Oh, you know, I'll never be able, no one's, ah. Oh. And then all of a sudden you wake up in a different energy state of being and you'll think, wow, what an amazing challenge. And I, I wouldn't swap that for the world because look at my life now. Now, nothing's changed factually. I was injured for four years in both of them. But the reality's changed simply because the energy's changed. And out of that energy, you, you look at something yeah. a different way. You see it differently. You feel about it differently. And then what you do in your day changes because of that energy. You become capable of different things. So anytime there's absolutes in people's language, this is how things are. Oh. It's, a, it's one to to sort of see that maybe that chain's getting locked. The energy system has become, this is just who I am. And yeah, that's how, that's how I used to be, 100%. You know, th th this is who I am. This is the way things be. And then because this is who I am, this is how you are. And suddenly you get very separated. Who I am is very closely linked to this, I think a cultural belief at some level that who I am is a result of all I've been through which is that if you like, depending on how, how you 
view what you've been through. It could be a victim mentality or a or a kind of privileged mentality or whatever. But when you start looking at the fact that that what you've been through can be seen differently depending on your energy state, you change it around to what I've who I am as a result of all I've been through suddenly becomes all I've been through is a result of who I choose to be now, which is empowering. It's this idea that who we are now is not a result of what's happened in our past. It's what's happened in our past is a result of who we are now. Yeah. Well, let's just dive in here because I think that is a pretty profound statement that I think has the potential to confuse, <laughs> has the potential to you know, really throw up all kinds of things in people's minds there. So what do you mean? I would say, from my perspective, who I've chosen to be today will give me the perspective on the past. So I don't need anything to make me who I am today. I have the freedom to be however I want to be today. And through those eyes, if I'm still interested in looking at the past, and this is an interesting one because, yeah, you will see it in the way that serves your dreams of who you are now. So another way of looking at this is, is maybe clears it up, but may make it more complex is that th the difference there with that is that when you try and say the past, and then we talk about changing the past, it feels a bit blocked. But actually, if you look at the experience of the past that we all have, I would speak just for myself and, and ask the question to anyone else is that no one's ever experienced a past. You just have memory. So if I said, well, tell me about the past, you'll go to your memory. You don't go to the past. So when you think about, rather than thinking I'm someone that has a past and a future, you think of yourself as being someone that, you know, who's living in the now between the past and the future. You then think of yourself as someone who is the now with memory and imagination. And once you realize that the past is actually in you as memory, not like a trail behind you, like a tail that you're wearing, or, or worse still, like a, yeah, here's where I was born, and I'm now tethered to that moment by a rope, and that rope's pretty heavy. So there's a bit of wiggle room because I'm trying to see it a bit differently, but not much. And because I'm tethered to that rope, that rope is also now deciding what's possible for me according to my understandings of what's been, they give me my understandings of what can be. So now I've got a rope coming out the front as well, which I'm holding onto, which is tethered to a more or less, you know, are you, you know, you can change your fate a bit, but not hugely. So it might be there or there, but more or less, I'm kind of stuck between these two ropes. And I'm just kind of like, and then the idea is in my head, the image I get is that you've got a tightrope underneath you and around the tightrope is the unknown. So you're using the past tethered you there and the safety rope of the future attached to where you're going to try and keep you on this thin line of now. Mm -hmm. And it's so difficult to enjoy the now because you've got all this unknown around you that you might fall into and you're constantly looking at your past to help you and your future to keep you online. Whereas in fact, actually, if it becomes you're just here with memory and imagination, we're not moving from a past to a future. You're exploring memory and imagination. And as you release that idea of it being a set past, what you're essentially saying is rather than saying, I can change my past, we're saying you can play with your memory. It's your memory. Mm -hmm. But because we have those emotional attachments to each memory, almost to those emotions that underpinned the memory at the time, they create the rope. Once you remove those emotions that belong to the energy state of how you are now, the, the the memory just floats around you and you can pick and work with it. You can join the dots together in different ways to form different ideas of how a, a past moment happened. But whilst there's this idea that, you know, I felt this way, and this is a lot of the thing I think we're in this therapy of releasing emotions yeah. and allowing them to be, is that as soon as you do that, you find that your past becomes softer, more playful. Mm -hmm. And it's just for me that it's coming back to now as memory that belongs to you as opposed to a past which is yours but you don't necessarily have any you can't touch it so that idea for me is really powerful because when you look at memory and imagination they're kind of the same mm. thing 
So as soon as you open up your past, you'll open up your future and you can start to dream again. So I look at it as a five-year-old child who, who maybe, or a three-year-old child who doesn't have that much of a, of a rope because they haven't got too many of the emotions that have drawn it together. And so what are they doing constantly? Dreaming yeah. all the time and dreaming freely. We dream in the sense of what if. With conditions. With conditions, not what if on a negative sense. Mm. Children dream on a what if purely positive at least i feel that that's a yeah. they should be dreaming that way they should be allowed to dream that way but getting back to that is often a sign for me of what my energy state is is when i dream how uninterrupted is my dream if i say dream of something amazing right now how clear can i be and how much does anything come in the way that say yeah. oh well you'll never go there i've dreamed myself on holiday or well, you'll never get a holiday because you don't get the time you know it's like well hold on <laughs> no let me dream this is my my freedom to dream and often your dream is interrupted by your idea of how things were and, and a really really big part of this for me has become really interested interesting and so different to how i was is this almost freedom to 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 actually not take so much notice of what's happening around us because that gets in the way of how things can be so often we're saying, people say, I oh, just try not to think about it. But actually what the problem is, is whilst we think everything's important, we're forming that emotional attachment behind us as a past. It's a trap, it, isn't it? It's a, so being able to be playful is the, is the key. Yeah. Be playful with everything. Find the beauty and, the, and the, the grace and the humor and the love in everything that allows it to have room. And if you find that you're not doing that, work on the energy state take yourself out like you said go for that walk where you can fully relax take yourself out rather than sit there and try and solve it which you know you're thinking about it feeds the feeling which feeds the thought which feeds the feeling and suddenly after 20 minutes of trying to work something out you've put yourself in a right old state and now suddenly that day is almost you know cemented mm. itself as part of that past and now you've got situations you're going to try and avoid people you can't work with and what have you. Whereas in fact, actually that playfulness is that space. And I think when you said about my journey, what did I become about the age of what, at 18? I was playful with the game. Anything could happen from any moment. By the age of 26, I'd lost all playfulness completely. It was stress, expectation, pressure, fear of failure, everyone getting in my way, no one understanding me, no one caring. Whereas when I was 18, I was staying at the field just thinking, oh, I, I don't need anything else. Yeah, and, and that playfulness is often a sign of whether that's you're playing with your memory, you're playing with your imagination, and you're playing with life, and that's, that's not a bad relationship to have, I think. What did winning the World Cup do for your ego at that time? Major reinforcement of the idea that because I have succeeded in a sense of I've achieved a goal, what, can, what I thought to be a very high bar of a goal with great competition and what have you, there was a, a real concreting in of self-importance. In other words, my ideas have been proven evidentially and therefore I am right, I have the answer. And so therefore I started spreading that answer in just my everyday behavior, but also quite consciously and in a sort of designed way i wrote i wrote a book that age um interviews wise and what was coming out of my mouth at that time was just my like i said that was my energy state with all those ideas getting stronger and that's how i saw the world so of course there was no effort to say i'll tell you what i see the world like this but i'm going to speak about it like this to sell books it was i see it so clearly because i'm so fixed on who i am now and I want to talk about the clarity because the clarity to me felt powerful, but go further down the chain. How did it make me feel? <laughs> that clarity, terrible. Yeah. You know, distance from everything, unhappy. And what was that making me think? All kinds of stuff that was troubling. And what was I doing? Surviving massively. And what was I creating? All kinds of stuff I didn't want. Injury, stress, yeah. everywhere. Well, that's what I hear. When I hear your story, when I sit with it, like I really feel 
the first part of your life, the the rugby player, the World Cup winning rugby player, the successful rugby player, meeting his dreams, achieving his dreams, you know, making the nation happy, all these kind of stories. What I hear is a certain rigidity, a desire to control everything, not only that you could control, but things that frankly, you probably couldn't control, but you were trying to. Right? So I, I get the sense of tension in the body. And what I hear these days is the shoulders dropping, just uh, acceptance and not trying to resist anything that comes up. Just accept it. Yeah. Is that a fair comment in terms of how you would summarize the, the difference between these kind of different states of being? Yeah, yeah definitely. The, the, the rugby playing idea was one of, they're both based on the, on the same understanding that where there is great focused intention, there can be manifestation of dreams. So where you hold your energies in line for long enough, you can make things happen. Now, in sport, we have a thing I look at where you have, in sporting terms, sometimes you see people and you just think, there's a genius. Why are they a genius? Because they make it look so easy. And it doesn't make logical sense to me to see someone put so little in, but get so much out. So you look at your tennis players and you think, no. And you look at football players and the creativity and the time they seem to have on the ball and the stuff they're seeing that people, how do you see that? It's all genius and it's all effortless. Yeah. Now, I had that genius on the field because there was a degree of me that was completely born to do it. That was my genius. But I also had a, another part of my state of being, which was a different kind of vibration, which was massively mistrusting. Mistrust, distrust, huge part of that dislocation of true self from yourself know, from idea of who I am from actually like the, the core innate sort of values of who I really am, you know, the, the loving, compassionate, um, worthy side was now replaced by this kind of fearful, um, competitive, uh, distrusting side. And because of that, I had enormous energy and desire to achieve my goals, but there was, I did it the hard way which was through distrust, which means I'm going to have to fight like mad for this because the way I was seeing the world was that everything is against me. It's going to slip up all the time if I don't do everything I need to. So tr my kicking sessions went from 20 minutes, half an hour, even by the age of 18. I, I remember one day I, I took my bike down to the park and told my mum I'm going to kick down at the the local club, she turned up later and said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? She said, you've been here five and a half hours. And I, I wasn't even thinking about coming home because, and it wasn't, some of it was joy. Most of it, a large part of it was just, I have to do this. I have, my confidence comes, my reassurance comes from seeing I can do it. And then you think, but can I do it again? I did it again. Just about to walk off. But can I do it again? It's a never ending loop. So I'd, yeah, you get to a stage where you say, yes, I can do it. The next morning I'd wake up, I better go and do some more. Why? Because I need to check if I can still do it. Total distrust. Now I, I did a whole career on that, but what it meant was that that intensity was probably my strong point. People couldn't live with it. However, that sort of switch you've spoken about between me then and me now was actually happening during the me then on the field when the whistle went. And that's what probably the secret was, was that the born to do it part came out when the whistles went. Because when the whistles went, you know, the first whistle goes and the action kicks in, there just isn't time yeah. to think everything through. And when there's no time, that's where I started becoming a genius. But I would play and play and play and I'd be a genius. And the referee would say penalty and I'd realize it's for me to kick the goal. Something I'd practiced more than anyone I don't think ever could genuinely and then they'd bring my kick and tee on and I'd set the ball up and now all of a sudden I've gone from no time to think 
born to do this genius, total trust, because I'm just not thinking about yeah. not trusting, to now suddenly put the ball on the tee and it's all distrust because I've got time to think. And it's all about, this is who I am. What do people think? I need to keep this alive. Whereas when I was in my genius mode, there was I let me go and let my yeah. genius come out. When I hear you say that, I'm drawn to two realities on the rugby field. Reality one is actually you have no time to think. So your innate genius, the, I was going to say 10,000 hours, but let's call it the 100,000 hours of practice or the, the, the million hours of practice. Maybe they come into that element then because you've got no time to think, you've done the work, so you can deliver and perform in that sort of state of flow. Yeah. That's in the midst of the game, so you don't have time to respond. But then, you know, you get a penalty and you go from passion and flow and creativity and expressing your talent to kind of fear and tension and anxiety. And I, I, I really want this conversation to, well, I, my hope is that this conversation feels relevant for, for everyone in their life as, you know, what's their equivalent of that? If not everyone plays in a World Cup final, but everyone has that or has had that conflict, I would think, at some point. Yeah. And and I think for me, the big thing that comes out of it as in terms of challenging a large, I think, a momentous movement of society or what has been a momentous one is that somehow those two things I mentioned, those two different states, are actually defined as one is preparation the other is performance so to suffer and struggle and sacrifice is preparation and that leads to great performance that leads to the zone and this is where my experience is completely at odds with this and therefore what i look at as my preparation now is that preparation and performance are the same thing which is why when it didn't used to be the case i'd constantly be speaking about i'm i'm really trying to live in the moment because I had in my head that there was some hierarchical perspective to this is an important moment where things are going to be, uh, are going to matter to who I am. And this is not. And therefore, this is where I'll use my time to worry about that big moment. Whereas the realization that every moment is practice for the big moment makes every moment a big moment or every moment a non big moment. In that, what I mean by that is in the change room, the idea is, can I let go in the changing room and be the best changing room version of me, the most free changing room version of me? And what about you know, on the Tuesday afternoon when I'm having lunch with my mates, can I be the most Tuesday version of me? In other words, am I able to take the rugby shirt off and put this having a laugh with my friend's shirt on or have I got have I got my rugby shirt on underneath and I'm trying to add a shirt over the top thinking that they'll do it and all I've got is half my mind going to the rugby and the other half is trying to stay here and say you know I'm having a laugh and the yeah. therefore preparation comes down to just how involved and fully engaged am I right now it's never about how am I looking for the future it's about now so yeah. if someone says and it's a really interesting one people say How's your life, right? Yeah, how's life? People sometimes say, yeah, it's all right. I've got this coming up, looking forward to that. And that's going to be good. But today's a bit, you're sort of like, but life is about now. So how's life is another way of saying, how's your now? And it's a big honesty question to, to be like, oh, hold on. I've been skipping the now because I got in my head somehow that I'm going to find my now later on. Yeah. And that's me for my life. And I think, you know, that, that idea is of preparation and performance are the same thing otherwise yeah. you're going to have a point where there's a moment in life where you're going to arrive and no one's found that moment i think this this idea that every moment is a big moment i think it's really powerful what i love about that is this idea you were talking about earlier in the conversation that we often wait for that one big moment where we have no choice apart from looking at ourselves differently and re-examining everything, but there are those micro moments every single day. What taking the bins out is a, is a prime example. Tomorrow morning, one of the things I will be doing is taking the bins out. 
to the front of my house so that the, the bins can get collected, right? How do you see that moment, that 20 seconds when I get the bin and I take it round and I make sure it's in the right place for it to be collected? If it's, uh, man, I can't believe I have to do this. You know, my partner said no. they would do it. They didn't do it. You know, as you're doing it with this frustration, A, you're not in the moment. B, you're bringing tension into your body. And, and certainly as a medical doctor, like I think we've been so reductionist in the way that we look at health. Health is health has multiple components, multiple dimensions. And I think a lot of us, whether it's my profession or society at large, doesn't recognize the importance of freedom in the body and that if we feel an emotional tension, if we are trying to resist what is, we actually create stress in our body. That stress is real. It's not imagined. That will that will cause tension and that will lead to issues. I mean, I hear the four years of injuries. And I'm thinking, well, I'm not surprised Johnny got injured if that was his life. Definitely. If he tried to control everything and push and push and push. To me, it doesn't sound just like it was a physical overtraining issue. I'd welcome your thoughts on this. To me, I'm hearing, was Johnny ever free in his body? Was it, did it ever relax? Apart from for those two hours on the pitch yeah. on a Saturday, was the rest of the week just tension? And if it was, well, of course he got injured. Yeah, exactly. And, and it wasn't even those two hours on the field because the game is broken up moments of absolute kind of chaos we're talking mini moments so many moments where you felt free an entire week you're looking at a handful of moments for an entire week and the rest of the week totally devoted to stressing in order to earn those moments as an idea which yeah, obviously was way out but in those moments you you're you because you let go your body and mind is able to operate at its fullest and the idea of the rest of the week is I'm going to compromise my body and mind enormously so that during the game, it's going to work brilliantly. It makes no sense. It makes no sense whatsoever. Hence the preparation and performance thing. It, it's not even logical. It stacks up and it affects your sleep as well. I think there's two processes going on constantly. One is stress and one is recovery. And stress is that energy going out and recovery is energy coming in, but I like recovery. I like the word healing. And what we tend to do is because of how I feel, what I tend, what I've definitely done is that you shelve healing and your day becomes stress because of how you see performance, because everything is about a bit fear-based, a bit got to stop this from happening, got to get this right, got to do this expectation, whatever. You get it done. And then you say, right, end of day, let me do some, recovery and healing at the end of the day. But the problem is, is that like you said, you're still thinking about your day. So you're still stressing, but you're just thinking I'm doing some healing as well. Cause at least I'm sat on the sofa watching TV and I might've relaxed my shoulders a bit, even though my mind's going. And then you get to the major healing, which is when you sleep. And it's the time that everyone heals the most because they who they are drops away. And it's the only time. So it's kind of like an amazing experience, but the more you stress, the less of that you get. Yeah. So now the the powerful thing of the understanding is when you operate within that genius setup through those, what I would call those connection points of the relaxation and the and the, the excitement and the you know the the alignment of of energies upon what you want, that kind of worthiness, that dreaming, that that ability to to aspire, and then also the the passion and the fulfillment and the worthiness all kicked in. You're recovering and performing at the same time. You're healing as well. So now you have a period where I, I spoke to an enlightened, an enlightened yogi um, once and, I, and he was telling me that he sleeps two and a half hours a night. My wife was with me and uh, she has a nutritionist background and she she loves the idea about the sleep and, and you know both of us kind of would love to have more. And she just jumped straight in and said, but how, how do you recover? And his response was, recover from what? And this was my point is that if every moment's a big moment and you're willing to allow, then you have this healing and 
energy going out at the same time. Because obviously when you run, even just by being alive, your heart beating is stressing. Mm. So there is all this stress and um, it, it's, it's happening. But recovery doesn't happen until I hit the sofa at night. Mm -hmm. And then I'll give myself permission to chill out. And until I'm at that big business meeting, I, that's when I'll give myself permission to really enjoy the moment or embrace the moment. But actually it's the it's the idea and um, something that's so big in terms of all of this with healing is that just clearing the idea that you have about the potential of every, any moment. So a bin layout, a putting the bin out moment because of how we've looked at it before and reinforced that idea, nothing can come from that. There's this idea that anything's not possible when you're putting the bins out. This is what's possible from the from putting a bin out. Maybe you might meet a neighbor. Yeah. And you might say, hey, hey, doing, um, chances are something else is going to go wrong. <laughs> Whatever it is, that's the, the size of it. But actually, without that idea in place, what's to say that that moment of life with everything going on around you, there's an interaction that you've asked for that's now available because you've stepped out the way and it just may happen whilst you're putting the bin up if you're receptive. Yeah. And, and that's when who every one people's life changing moments they'll often say i was just walking down the road you wouldn't believe what happened yeah and it's not it's often because you step out the way and allow allow these things to happen and it, whilst you have an idea that this is the potential of this moment it, it can't be allowed this is the potential of this other person i'm speaking to that's the kind of person they are that's the story of who they are that's the as far as the story will ever go so therefore i'll chat to them but not yeah, but actually the meaningful exchange, why does it have to be with your, your boss or someone yeah. that has the contacts to send you? Why is it not this person you've never seen before who's just walked past you, who's in your life for a reason? The only reason it's not available there is because you've chosen that it can't be there. Yeah. A couple of thoughts come to mind. Yesterday, I went, I was working at home. I thought I'd go for a quick walk. And, I, you know, I had, a, I had a lot to do. So I thought, okay, Quick 25 minute walk around the block and then I'll get on. And I don't know, halfway round, uh, this elderly lady who often is out walking her dog stopped to chat. And I know a few years ago, there would have been a sense of frustration yeah. in me that, oh man, well, I'm going to, I'm going to chat because she's super nice and it would be rude not to. Um, but in my head, it'd be like, how long is this going to last? Because I need yeah. to get back. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. You know, I'm not perfect. I do fall into that sometimes, but I feel I have an awareness now where in that moment, and this is what happened yesterday, it was like, oh, okay, well, I've got an opportunity to connect with this wonderful lady who wants to talk. Actually, let's just do that in the moment and see what happens. And, you know, you, you literally change your experience of the same situation. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. You said before that you're weak as a professional rugby player was often six and a half, six and three quarters, maybe six and seven eighths. Seven minus a tiny bit. Really. Days off yeah. that week with tension, stress, anxiety. As you say, you would sacrifice your body and mind for those few micro moments on the pitch when everything stopped, the mind stopped and you were just in flow. I noticed when you said that, you said your body and mind. So that was the cost that you paid to be that successful. Or well, certainly that's one interpretation of it. What were some of the other costs that had to be paid for that level of success? And I guess I'm thinking more about, well, anything really, but also the people around you, your relationships. I mean, Maybe that's a side we also don't see when we see the person lifting the trophy on the podium, getting to that place that people think they want to get to. What, what, what were some of those other costs? I think when you're speaking about the, co the cost of that success, I, I would, I'd ref for me, I'd reframe that to saying it was the cost of distrust. It was that was the cost of a lack of trust in yourself. So I had a big dream with a lack of trust in myself and that was the cost of it. Lack of trust in just yourself or people around you as well? It's the same thing. So once I start with a lack of trust in myself, it automatically projects itself into lack of trust in others, lack of trust in life. Because that lack of trust in me is essentially I'm not worthy 
or deserving and therefore this person's out to get me because I'm not deserving of being in a great conversation. So there must be something more at play here. I might be being used in some way. So there's a distrust there and, I'm, and I feel great and we've just won a game, but I'm not worthy of this. So I, my trust in life is where's the banana skin? Mm -hmm. So always looking for the problem. Survival, because that distrust is something's out to get me. So I'm going to live in survival. You mentioned control and I'm going to control my future rather than create it. Hence those two energy, energy states of being. You create your future with your imagination and your alignment and your, your energies and your, your, just, your, your just involvement, or you can control it. And now one of those is stressful, one of them's not. And I, the, the cost of that distrust or that, that, that hole in me was huge, you know, just the fullness of relationships. As we, basically, the comment, making the most of your life, just comes down to fully trusting in yourself and realizing your worth. Now that's a, that's a hell of a journey to go on, but they're the same thing when you're for me, when you're in full deserving, worthy mode and trusting of yourself, you're making the most of life because yeah. the only thing we interact with in this life is ourselves. And so your interaction with yourself is the interaction you have with life. So every problem that's or, or disconnect on the inside will be represented on the outside. So that self-love, that whole idea about the, you know, the mask on the airplane, who drops down, put yours on first put some, put, before you put someone else's on. It's a really good one. Apart from the fact it needs to be amended to realize that you never put anyone else's on. You put yours on and everyone else's will happen according to your desires as long as you look after you in every moment. And looking after you for me is, is yeah, you mentioned, I think yeah, before we've spoken about the four pillars of health, exploring those to the utmost, taking away the idea like the bin moment of this is all that can come out of putting the bins out. This is all that can come out of me eating the this kind of food. But yeah, as long as you feel that way and think that way, that is probably all that can, but it'll probably be less according to how else you're feeling about yourself in there. But so the four pillars of house, health plus a complete openness and willingness to involve yourself with life on a full level which means getting out of your own way and getting out of your own way for me just means dropping that idea yeah, yeah. it's interesting yesterday evening about five half five i was just knackered i'd had a i just was physically and emotionally very tired and again i was like oh man johnny's coming tomorrow morning um uh, because the interview is at half seven in the morning which is the earliest I think we've ever done an interview <laughs> because my process before I, I say interview, I don't know why I said that because mm. I'd never consider them interviews. I consider them conversations and my typical process is before a guest comes to the studio, I will have been researching and I say researching it again. It feels like quite a dry word. Yeah. Really like I've really enjoyed delving into your life over the past few days. It's been a real, because I've learned so much about myself through studying you. Yeah, I've seen so many similarities. I've learned things. And so my whole process is about really trying to, I've not thought about it like this, but really feel the energy of that other person. Who are they? What, what kind of connection might I be able to, um, sort of foster with them when, when they're in. And I like about an hour and a half before they come just to make a few notes. It just helps me imprint things in my mind that I may want to talk about. And I caught myself going into this anxiety trap for just a few seconds that, oh man, I'm knackered. Um, Johnny's coming a wet of time in the morning to prepare. And I thought, wait a minute, what do you need to prepare? You're talking to someone who you really like, who you really respect. You've spent time absorbing the story. You know how to have a conversation. And I remember saying to my wife in the kitchen, you know, all I need to do, the best thing I can do is switch off, go to bed early and get eight hours sleep. Because if I do that, I've got much more likelier than I'm going to be present and attentive and be able to respond to yeah. whatever the possibility might be. Yeah. And 
the reason I share that is because I kind of feel, I, I strongly, strongly believe that there's, there's a moment, there are multiple moments for learning every single day yeah. if we open our eyes Definitely. to them, right? Yeah. You know, every moment, every moment, whatever's in your path, for me anyway, whatever's in my path is a mutual serving going on. Yeah. If it's a person, if it's a thing, if it's an idea that's been inspired, it's, there's something from it. And rather than study it, just to allow it and it'll come through. But it's really interesting what you're saying because it's one thing that's important that doesn't come through of what, what I'm saying is that that trust in yourself and it doesn't mean that you now no longer need to, you know, almost like, well, I don't need to do any more of anything because things will just work out, which almost has that kind of I don't care attitude. Mm. But the underwriting key of all of this is that it's determined by your desires what it is you want and the more energy you have for what you want the the the, the more intense and more things will come up to serve it the energy system as i think about that i think about intention because as you've you've already mentioned we can dream in two different ways. We can dream as a child with this infinite possibility, or we can dream with a sense of worry and yeah. an attachment to that dream actually happening. I feel that we can be motivated yeah. as I have been, and it sounds as though you have been for much of your life from a, from a place of lack, there's something missing. So therefore that's my drive, that's my motivation because I will compensate for that lack. Right. But you can also, I guess, have motivation from a sense of fullness and abundance. Yeah. And so I think this idea of the same behavior or the same, the same word, dreaming, motivation, confidence, success, actually, they're not really one word. It's what's the energy behind that word? Yeah. What's the intention? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. And that is really interesting that so much of what we're talking about for me anyway is this is this understanding that i think being on this earth is having all the power of the the creative force behind it within us and it's and it's crammed into this sort of or it feels like it's crammed into this physical form and as it's in there it wants to go back to being all it is so it's expanding and as it expands it's hitting upon our limits and that's desire it's why you never goes away you know you have this feeling of like i'm so much and i'm constantly desiring more and more because i know i'm i'm infinite i'm so much in here and so i can't stop wanting things and i can't stop dreaming and i can't stop feeling and what have you and it's pushing on those those limits which is why when we reinforce those limits and it pushes against them sometimes we get that conflict so when we want to make things safer or when we get really identified with this is who I am in this physical body, it feels like there's got to be more to life than this. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that part of you that's infinite and, and ever expanding is saying no, no to this idea you've got. You, you, you're holding me back. Yeah. And it's asking the whole time. And what we keep doing is thinking we'll, we'll answer it by reinforcing those boundaries a bit with some reassurance or some physical stuff. And it's going, no, no, you've got to go bigger than this. And all of that, the whole point about, you mentioned about the ego or the, the ideas we have is that we keep bumping them out. And as we bump them out and, and let some go and, and then we'll find more in there, the deeper down. But mm -hmm. as we do that, the energy in, in us is able to expand and that's the growth. That's the connection as we feel like we, we're starting to connect to more of ourselves. Yeah. And so everything is about expansion. You mentioned about dreaming with the idea of, motivated by that desire of wow how great could everything be and then you've got the dream from a fear perspective now one of those is is a once you dream about how great everything can be all you need to do is set it in motion and it naturally just keeps expanding it's incredible it's a sense of that creativity that has no boundaries you started off and before you know it you're, you're just you can't stop when you start with a fear-based one it contracts and gets smaller and smaller until you're in a space where you feel like i feel so restricted is that how you felt after the world cup I've, it's how i felt in the change room beforehand 
and as much as because there's that need to survive and get through and so as you're, you're inside your boundaries you've created your walls of who you are and you want to reinforce them now you're not going to go outside of them to add to the wall so you'll stay inside them and add to the wall so you're losing more space yeah reinforcing you don't go out of your boundaries into the unsafe and so you can build more layers because it'd be counterproductive so you build them from the inside so extra reinforcement just shuts you into more and more of a space so the more controlling you get the more survival it gets the more reassurance it gets it's coming to a point of crisis whereby you put a brick in and you go oh my god i'm now stuck and that's the moment of this has yeah. to stop and i think that's what i did at the beginning it starts with a uh, people like me people are talking about me as if i could be someone and then you think i'll oh, just do a bit more and i don't want to make any mistakes because i don't want to let them down or that idea and then 10 years down the line someone who saw you at 18 comes and speaks to you and says what's happened to you what's happened and it's the same thing i say to the guys that i might coach them when i'm kicking is that we'll create this liberated space and they kick a ball and they give permission to really be free and just explore it and we say wow look at that it took two minutes now you've got all week imagine what you could do with all week that was two minutes and at the end of the week they come back and it's like what happened what's happened to you and it's the question of what are we doing with our time in preparation it, it's liberating preparation liberation is is preparation whereas i think what we think is preparation is about walking into a room and saying look at how solid these walls are i've built mm. i'm not getting outside of them ever but at least you can see me you can see me from space that's how solid i've built my that's how much i've become a someone you can see me i'm distinct you know who i am you know what i'm about because i've built these walls and i'm stuck in them and i don't like this mm. but part of me quite enjoys the fact that that i'm getting that feeling like i'm expanding because people can see me and they know me and they recognize me but actually the internal experience will eventually call out sort of stronger and, and demand that those walls come down i think the way you think about the world, see the world, feel the world today in 2022, as we have this conversation, if you looked at the world and felt the world through the same lens when you were 23, could you have performed at that higher level and could you have helped your team win the World Cup? I genuinely like to think that 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 outcome was going to be that outcome, whatever. The route there would have been different. The reason that outcome would have happened is because the desire would have burnt equally as strong. And nothing that's what really matters is the desire. And the more you're able to channel it and, and align it, the more immediate that process becomes. It becomes almost sort of things appear in a much more sudden way whereas when you go through this is what i want i've got to fight for it you create the fight and it becomes a long drawn out process and as is the expression goes what you resist pers persists so you get the same lesson over and over yeah i had those four years of injuries i had 14 injuries in a row and i only learned the lesson when i went to play in france i got away from what i perceived to be and, and essentially it's all about giving yourself permission to what to let go but when you feel like you're in a physical state the physical world needs to give you permission and so rather than just being able to give yourself that permission by being able to accept as we spoke about or or love or or let go or, or meditate or do all those kind of important non-self-serving things that's the the permission but in order to go to that space i needed permission from the outside what i thought was the outside so I was in England where I had this idea that everyone there knew me and they expected from me and what have you. And 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 I had this idea that I wasn't achieving and that I was being scrutinized. And, and so going to France, the south of France, was an escape. That was a bit of the permission. The second thing was I was by the seaside and it was sandy and it was sunny and the people speaking a different language. As far as I was concerned, I was also on holiday. So now I'm on holiday, miles from where I am, thinking that no one cares about me anymore. And eventually what that did was say, oh, big exhale. 
And my body said, oh, hold on, he wants to heal. Yeah. Let's get in. Not and, in survival mode anymore. And, no, and, and for, a sh for about six months, I healed fast. Sorry to interrupt. If you are enjoying this content, there's loads more just like it on my channel. So please do take a moment to press subscribe, hit the notification bell, and now back to the conversation. I had a dislocated kneecap, which had cartilage ripped off the back of it. And I had an order. So I had a big, big operation on that, which they were saying, you may not come back. And all of a sudden, within six months, I was play I played every game there, but after six months, the French supporters, amazing guys, started turning up with banners with my name on, and I start thinking, oh, oh, no. I'm a success. Well, no, I'm thinking, yes, I'm thinking, I'm doing well. I'm getting confirmation, and that old part of me, the old understanding which has yet to clear, is saying, oh, I better make sure I don't, because I don't want them <laughs> not turning up. And within another six months, I'm in that space. I'm kicking for three hours again my groin's hurting and I'm saying, yeah. what am I doing? And and it's incredible what it takes. And the last game of my career, 2014, I'm in the changing room before the French cup final, the French um, league final. We've won the European cup. We're hoping to do the double, never been done before. And I'm 35, I've played everything. I've seen everything. I've had every lesson I could possibly have in that time. And if someone comes in there and says, sign this contract, you win, but you don't get to play. I'm signing it. I'm still signing it. That's how much the fear is in that I'm willing to give up everything I love, what I was born to do, go out there, play, express my talent, feel it, be challenged, be in the moment with everyone. I'm pretty much willing to say, yeah, I'll go out the back door, but as long as I can have the prize at the end of it. Despite the fact in 2003, I had the prize and realized there was nothing there. Yeah, it was the outcome. That energy you state. To, you needed the outcome. The energy state created the idea that the outcome will solve me. That's the thought that comes from the way you see the world. And I'm in. Yeah. That's how it's tricky. It's not one of those where you, you, you unless it's, challenge isn't challenge unless it comes in a form that you don't want. Yeah. And, and often the biggest ones are the ones you can't even see. It's just, no, no, there's no challenge here. This is just how life is. And it's, and it, it's crazy. Isn't it, it? It's crazy. But, You'd give up playing the game that you love just for the trophy. I'd have done it for 95% of the games I played. The only ones I wouldn't have done were when I was 18. Yeah. When it was a joy when because I hadn't, joy. I didn't have that idea of who I was. But the, the other thing which is, you know, mad about it is that I was speaking to my brother about this just, just yesterday, that the times where I've been at my absolute best, I think, and just played like just beyond what I thought was possible were probably a couple of times. And when I was young, one of them and the other one a little bit older, I turned up to training and realized there was a game and it wasn't training. I didn't have my kit, didn't have my boots and it was basically mm -hmm. two minutes till kickoff. I had my boots, but not my, my kit. And, and someone's come out and said, we're playing a game. And I've gone, what? I didn't know. Here, look, borrow a shirt, get out there, and you're on the field. You haven't had time to go yeah. through the whole survival. And part of you gives in and just says, oh, well, might as well just give it a go. And suddenly the clarity, the the, the flow state is in straight away. Same with all kinds. And later on when I get pulled into things, I've been at England training, um, and suddenly the England coach, this is after I've retired, is sort of saying, I want you to run in today. Um, what? I haven't, um, all right, uh, I've got my boots. And you, I'm sort of thinking, I hope my hamstring doesn't go. And you, But you just get on there and you go, oh, well. Yeah. And your desire says, I'm in, but your ideas say, we haven't had time. We're out. And the desire's in, the ideas are out, and suddenly it's like, ah, oh, yeah, now I see. Now I see where it is. And it's that, it's, that's the lesson I've had all the way through my career in the moments in the game where I've just let go and it's been like, yes, there's the simplicity. And yet I just didn't know about the energy state. Mm. I've been working later down the chain. Yeah. And because of the, f because you've managed to create what you wanted to create more or less, and it's come in a certain way, you then give yourself permission to reinforce, you know, to concrete in those chains and say, right, this is what, this will be me. But it also means that's the end of you. Yeah. End of growth and end of everything that goes with it. When I first read that in most of your games, you were given the option to not play them, yeah, you would have taken it. It surprised me 
but it also deeply resonated with me on a completely different level and scale. I have attached success and winning to being a huge part of my identity. And I think I've got a pretty good idea of where that came from in my childhood. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, very briefly, I feel certainly at this moment in time that my parents as immigrants to the UK who, you know, face a lot of discrimination and they wanted the very best for their children to not go through the same things as them. Their, their route for us was you excel, you get straight A's, you go to a top university, get a top job, and then life is good. So, you know, anytime I came back with anything less than 100%, it was like, well, you know, 19 out of 20, why didn't you get 20? 99%, why didn't you get 100? And perspective is huge here because having spoken to having spoken to someone recently about this, she was doing it, I think, from a place of love. But little Rongan takes on the idea that, oh, I'm only worthy, I'm only enough when I'm top of the class, when I've got the best grades. <laughs> and you take on that identity and this self-limiting belief your entire life until you, first of all, realize it, because when you're within it, like you're blind to it. You go through your life blind. You think yeah. this is who you are. And so you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> it's not who I am. It's who I was. It's who I thought I needed to be. But what happens if I remove that and let go of that? And the particular moment that comes to mind is if I was playing any sport with my mates, I wanted to win. Yeah. Right? It was... I, I I I write about this in, in the start of chapter three in my new book. I write about this moment when I was in at uni in Edinburgh, and like on a Sunday afternoon, we'd often go to Diane's pool hall just to you know after a couple of nights out, just to unwind on a Sunday afternoon. And I'm a pretty decent player. If I was ever losing, like I I would go into the toilets, look myself in the mirror, give myself a pep talk, <laughs> oh, give, yeah, give myself some slaps. Yeah, on that. I don't yeah, know if that's yeah, a knowing yeah. laugh or not. But then the yeah. funny thing is, is that you'd come out. Yes, you would probably play better because yeah. of it. I guess most of the time you'd end up winning. Occasionally you wouldn't. But what I figured out over the last few years is I I actually didn't enjoy winning, losing was too painful for me. Yeah. Right. So it wasn't that I wanted to win. I wanted to not lose. Yeah. And I think I've carried that for so much of my life. And it's a very lonely place to be. It's a very empty place to be. It's a very stress inducing place to be. And I don't know, does any part of that story or, or those stories resonate with you? Yeah. I, um, <clears throat> the winning thing is, is, yeah, really, really interesting. And it's so it's so linked to self-worth. Yeah. When you lose, it's immediate. It, and it's so obvious. I feel so unworthy because I because I haven't won at something. I remember having a, a running race at school and I used to be quite fast when I was <laughs> I used to be. I didn't carry on too far into my playing days. But I uh I remember we had these right and, and everyone in the school used to say oh, he's really fast, he's really fast. But I could sense that there were these other kids in the school that were getting probably a bit faster and that maybe my my reign at the top was coming to an end. And we had a race on a on a grass track. And, and for so it's mad that this happened. I can't even work out how it happened. But it, we're talking like eight, nine years old. And the headmaster's out there timing it between three of us. And it's in a break time. I don't know how it's got to this serious. But anyway, we're running and about halfway into the race i realized that i'm not i'm behind a little bit behind and, and i'm i'm sort of like becoming probably just aware that i'm trying as hard as i can and i'm not making up the distance and then a one of the you know really young kids four or five is at the school it's kind of like walks across the track but is it's kind of like walks across my lane but way before i'm there and of course i kind of make a big deal of it yeah, and then by the end of the race, I'm I'm thinking I'm saying, and people I can see people are starting to say that the other boy's fast, and I start to my, my brain is saying I've got to find a reason here because 
the idea that I just come out and be vulnerable in that space to say, oh, or heaven forbid I should turn to the boy and say, hey, well played, you're, you're really fast. I love that. Good for you. you use, I mean, no chance. I'm survival mode, protect, deflect, everything. And I'm sort of going on about how oh, it's got in front of me in the track and I couldn't move. But And walking back towards the classrooms or whatever, I just remember I'm in shock. And it's powerful. It's powerful shock. And I've got numerous incidences of this that I can remember that plagued me. And, and I would, a day would go by and then the thought of it would come up in my head and then the shock would come back with the thought. And I'd start to say to myself, I, I'm never going to be able to forget this. And I can't stand this feeling and I can't live with it. And I can't stop thinking about it. And then sure enough, I'd go off and find something. I look, you know, my brother and we'd be playing or, or I'd be doing something else with my mum and dad and we'd be having fun. And then suddenly the thought would come up and the shock would come up. And I'm starting to picture that for the next 90 years, this is me. Mm -hmm. Because you, and, and it's, it's so real. And that's what I remember is, is everything was so serious in those moments. You mentioned about that playfulness that from quite an early age, mine was fear-based and that I just came to this idea that I had a sense of doom about everything, that there was something slightly underhand that was going on that was out to get us in this world and that I I had, the way I protected about myself was being perfect. Mm -hmm. And so I made up what perfect was and then I went after it. But again, same as you, uh, 17 out of 18 and a spelling test, I, I spelt the word gauge wrong. So I'm, this is when I'm nine years old. I can remember it. I got 17 out of 18. I spelled the word gauge wrong. And that's it. I'm in. Yeah, like a, a, a classic would would be, uh, I've, I've mentioned this before, but it's a, a really powerful one. that I did a radio interview when I was 11 because our school under 13s team were unbeaten and Surrey Radio took us on. And I, the, the, the guy asked me, so how did you get into rugby? And I said, oh, yeah, because of, uh, uh, I can't think, I'm a bit flustered. I watch these guys on TV and I, I, I just sort of copy them. And I felt pretty good after that. And I got home and said to my mum, yeah, I did the interview today. Oh, how'd it go? What did they ask you? They asked me how I got into rugby. And I said, I, I said, I just watched the, pro the guys on TV. And she said, did you mention your dad? You know, the one that's been coaching you since the age of four and has taken to every game. And my world has fallen apart just in that moment because I sort of sensed that you know oh my god what have, what have I done you know like this and I'm th you know, thinking that that's so unfair that I haven't mentioned him and he's put all this hard work in and he would be saying don't worry about it you know like what are you talking about it's fine I don't care it's like I just really it's not a problem and then also he'd be like but it's and it's don't worry it's sorry radio you know it's gone it's been and done but months months, months months where I'd and I'd burst into like tears just watching TV the thought would come up the shock with it and then it'd just be uncontrollable mm. and wherever he was I'd run over hey I'm sorry about that thing and he's like sorry about what yeah. I mean, it was like months ago but you can understand that that's reality there is no and this everyone's like it doesn't matter but of course it matters to you in your heads it's reality it means that I've somehow let the door to this thing that's out there and it's 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 so interesting that you know that energy state about fear is that you live fear. Yeah, it's reality. And the same way that when you have an energy state desire, you know, more aligned with joy and whatever, you, you live joy. It's that simple. And you can work directly on the energy state. But of course, so much of the idea of that thing is like just try not to worry about it. But you know, the idea about saying try not to think about something is another way of saying just think about this for a bit. You know, try not to think about a pink monkey, and you think about a pink monkey. What does happiness mean to you these days? Happiness is 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 that connection with with worth. It's it's that happiness comes from gratitude for you know when I'm in a grateful state for being alive. That for me is happiness, and that for me is immediately engagement in life. I used to talk about. To some of the guys who talk about, yeah, you know, I want to be, I want to be out there on the field and just enjoying it. And I thought this in my career. So I, I remember watching a video of a game once and thinking, what am I doing? And I was walking around with a big smile on my face and doing this. And I knew at the time I was hating it. 
because happiness doesn't necessarily mean a massive smile mm. although often it does and i think it's brilliant when it does because it's a infectious and it it's an amazing thing but engagement is joy on that rugby field when i said i was just at one i'm not smiling but there is absolute joy in that and that's happiness is is a sense of involvement in life which is that gratitude for being here and recognizing that that I deserve to be here and I deserve what I want in life simply because I am here. Because if I didn't deserve it, I wouldn't be here. Now, I, I, there was an expression I, I really liked by someone saying that you're that important to the universe that if with you here, it's all it can be. Without you here, it would only be some of what it could be and it couldn't exist. You're that important. That's how important we are. That, that you're here because you're supposed to be here. And actually, according to your desires and and your makeup and the energy states and all the buildup of the karmic stuff in there and all this kind of business that's driving you, life has devoted itself to us all individually in its own amazingly unique ways that we all have these incredibly different experiences and we all have our different challenges and we're all so unique and taking on such different things, but each of us is being attended to mm -hmm. fully. Not one of us is having more of life and life giving less is in fact, this often works out that someone that feels like I'm getting more of life, look, I've got the money in this. Oh my God, I'm so unhappy. To the persons that I've got nothing and challenged and then suddenly oh my, I'm revealing so many incredible things is that life's giving everything to to us all and it, i think for me you know sometimes it it it's just a case of being receptive to it yeah to realize that you've launched a new podcast which is fantastic why have you called it i am and why did you decide to launch it because launching it because it's my passion mm -hmm. and it just it, it was another one of those inspired things that came out when you're sort of thinking i never thought about doing one and all of a sudden it was kind of yeah you know, actually people were saying to me you should do one i i no, it's not really i'm just interested in this and all of a sudden i thought i really want to speak to this person mm -hmm. and i think this person i think some of the messages i think people might like because i was speaking to more and more people and they were being interested in kind of this side of things. I thought this would be really interesting. So I, I started on that and just did one. And as I did it, I suddenly realized I liked, I liked just probing and then allowing mm. to kind of ask a question and just sit back and go, wow, this is brilliant. And of course, it's always a good sign when you, you're doing something which is, you know, which I guess could be determined as some kind of career based thing, but you're looking at thinking, this is just what I'll be doing anyway. Yeah. I mean, it's better than what I'll be doing because I'd normally be at home listening to this kind of stuff that you're saying, but now I'm talking to you about it and I get your presence and everything. And why I am, because exploring what that true self may look like, or, or, or not may look like, but, but other people's experience of it to help that worthy connection of ideas to expand back towards the infinite you know the true self of there's no boundaries to what we really are so when our idea expands we're getting closer to it mm -hmm. and I, th I think just to explore what other people's ideas and, and and experiences have been of that connection is important and i am because that's all it's about it's about the i am before it attaches to something else i am a woman i am a man i am um uh, you know, a doctor or a sportsman. I am good. I'm bad. I'm, I'm, I'm Johnny. Anything that follows the am is a limit upon the potential. I'm free. Still not as much. It's like going back to the car garage idea. When you're looking at the cars, I am. Now it's an, I'm a car owner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but before that, I just am. And that's where all the possibility is. It's the unrealized is where potential is. So when the I am sits unrealized, that's where all the possibility is. So if someone if someone was to ask you, who are you today? 
how does what you just said frame that answer? It's really a good one because I can't talk about the I am that I was talking about then because I don't necessarily, I only have my experience of it. And when I talk about it, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of slightly shift towards the I am what's Something. next. Yeah. But there is the thing that keeps me feeling and, and really feels honestly, truthfully close to the I am is the open endedness of the answer I'll give, which is that I'm unknown. That's a genuine experience is that I have no idea who I am. I just have, I was so sure at one time, now I have no idea. I was so sure of past and future, I've no idea now. It's moved to that state now where I'm just, I'm excited and curious about all of that. So who am I? I've got, I've got so, I've got nothing for you other than the fact that I, I, I feel unrealized. I feel like I'm a work in progress that's never going to progress. <laughs> I feel like it used to be a journey, but a journey gives the sense that you've come from somewhere and you're going somewhere. I'm actually, I'm actually an adventure. I'm an adventure, which means it's, I'm an exploration. And I'm, I'm, I feel like the best thing about it that I can say is that I'm never going to arrive at an answer for that or an answer for anything. And, and it's in that space. Like I said, I'm back in that, I'm back in that car garage. Mm -hmm. My pockets feel full. And it's not just cars, it's like every moment of life is in that garage. And I'm looking at each one thinking, these are all great. I'm just going to, I'm just going to sort of, I'm just going to enjoy them all and, and do my best to, to remain free of, of becoming attached to too many of them. Does it matter to you through this conversation, through the conversations you're having on your podcast, does it matter to you what other people think? Your former teammates, um, your former colleagues, people who knew you and interacted with you when I guess you were in a very different energy state to the energy state you're in right now. Like I'm really interested because the way you speak is, is not the way people expect an ex-rugby player to speak and, you know, an expectation of what, I mean, that we're all just humans doing the best that we can. So, so I get there's a, there's like contradiction even in what I've just said, but this idea that what if someone you used to be close to was a close teammate thinks or says publicly, uh, man, you know, <laughs> Johnny back then dedicated, knew the goal, work hard would pull us all up around and we'd get that goal i don't recognize who he is today I, yeah. I don't i don't get what he's talking about there's been a few of those <laughs> yeah so more than a few yeah so so yeah so therefore as someone who who i feel seems to have got a lot of his identity in the past from external validation yeah are any of those tendencies still left what happens when you get that criticism or the negativity, does it matter? Have you learned to uh, frame it differently? You know, what, what happens there? I get a big... It used to be when in a game when something would happen and go well, whether it be a kick, mostly it was a bit of play. And they had, if it was sometimes an external voice when I was younger, I was actually quite sort of, uh, I was quite sort of, unfortunately a bit a bit verbal on the field but also internally you'd have a voice that would say yes i get that yes the other way around now so when i have those triggered moments i i literally look and say yes this is it so i have of course everyone has those critical yeah people when they say critical people have an idea that they would like you to do things differently or whatever you and if that triggers me when i get triggered I say, yeah, 
this is it. This is my moment now. So you, you mentioned about the external validation. I'm kind of like, well, that that's going to hold me back. Yeah. So I want to, if I've got some in me, I want to see it. You know, I need someone to shine a bright light because if I think I've cleared a lot of it and there's loads in there hiding, I need a bright light to show, shine it. And that bright light will come because I'm asking for it. And it may come in the form of this or this or this. And if I get caught in trying to prove myself, I'm going to miss the point. So I'm on the one hand, I'm, I'm, I like being triggered. On the other hand, I know from being alongside a lot of those guys when I was younger that we all wanted the same thing. Mm. We wanted to be free and happy. And I know that it's so difficult for players coming out of the sport, which seems to have so much attachment and, and highs and lows to it that gives you a feeling of being someone that when it's taken away from you, you end up with the immediate sense of being no one that everyone's on that journey. Everyone's on the journey towards, as you said, happiness and finding out what their worth is. And so I, there's always that connection the same way that if, if you want to connect with someone, you don't think you've got anything to say, you'll connect over the fact that what is it you really want in life? Oh, sure. Funny enough, we got that in common. <laughs> what is it that really holds you back in life? Oh, funny enough, we can talk about that forever. Or if we've got those two, out the way we can talk about tell me about something yeah tell me some stuff in life that you don't know about yeah and you'll find that we don't know so much and the, the i think we're all on that journey anyway the other part of it finally is just that um when you meet people because i was up at, in newcastle just yesterday meeting so many of guys i hadn't seen for 10 years plus 15 years um, I don't talk like this when you talk to them. <laughs> Funny enough, this is this is geared to the energy of our conversation and what have you and, and the energy of the room. And Whereas when you meet people, they wouldn't notice the change. Mm. Not because I'm holding anything back, but because that's the best, that's, that's the, the m most strong connection is there mm. through that. So we have a laugh. My language has changed because there's, I was really judgmental when I was younger because of this need to reference myself as better and what have you. So often other people took the brunt of that by me, you know, you're not professional, you don't want it enough, you know, you shouldn't be here, all this kind of stuff so that I could feel better about myself. And so that's of no interest to me anymore. I don't, you know, it's just everyone is equally valued and worthy. So, but naturally you guide conversations into areas where it always ends up being about this though. It mm, yeah. doesn't matter what you start on at some point. And it's, it's crazy how it, it almost from a, um, I don't know, sort of, it is a synchronistic kind of happening that someone will just say something. Yes. It's just been a bit tough for some of this. I mean, Oh, really? What's happening? This, this, this. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then one comment is kind of like, yeah, that's funny. You should say that actually. Yeah, do you want to catch up at any time? Yeah, yeah, sure. Hmm. And if people say, what on earth are you talking about? Then it's almost kind of like to me, if it challenges me, then brilliant. But often that's that's probably on me because I've misread the energy. Hmm. Whereas, and, and I think that's where I'll be trying to be something. Whereas when you're listening, you know, if someone says something to you and you respond up here when they've spoken here, I mean, that's because I haven't read where, where mm. the opportunity was. Yeah. And often, you know, trying to talk about this stuff when it's not relevant, I mean, that's not their fault. No. That's, that's, that's on me. But, it's, but actually, the route to this is always there if you kind of, because it's my desire. I'm really interested in growth. I love the fact that people can feel, you know, like also they're on that journey. And if that's my huge underlying intention when we talk, chances are that's going to manifest in yeah. some way. To finish off this, you know, mind expanding uh, conversation, one of the quotes I've written down that I've heard you say is making friends with the unknown is the biggest key to connecting with yourself. I think it's really, really powerful. This podcast, Johnny, is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel better in ourselves, we get more out of life. There's been a lot of wisdom shared in this conversation, but I always like to finish off with some final thoughts from my guests. I think many people will feel inspired. Some might feel a little 
confused, but also challenged and and also, mm, I want to go there. Yeah, I want to go there. Maybe I need to re-listen. Yeah. Maybe I need to pause and rewind a few times. As you say, we all at our core want the same things. We want that happy, joyful, passion-filled life. Do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share with my audience? I think probably the most important part of this, when you said about feel better, live more, I feel like the the whole thing comes down to 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 that sense of worthiness and the biggest message which is so difficult because sometimes it feels like it can step away sometimes from people suffering and struggling and like I said challenge doesn't come unless it's or challenge isn't really valid challenge unless it's it's a challenge everyone is facing challenges and I think you know we had a chat before and, and I, I really enjoyed what you were saying about you know uh, relating to what I'm talking about that energy state of being if I was in your energy state of being right now, I'd be doing exactly the same thing. Yeah. There is nothing better, worse, right, more right or more wrong about me than you. But also, it's important to realize that that you just can't know anyone else. If you want to know them as much as you, you can ever know them as you have to know yourself deepest that's the work and i think that's the biggest respect to pay to anyone is to say what can i offer you i can just offer you all of me and to get all of me out i've got to work on what's stopping me from being all of me if that conversation resonated with you here is another incredibly powerful one that i really think you're going to enjoy just let that blow your mind for a moment i will explain it i promise i'm not what i think i am i'm not what you think i am i am what i think you think i am which means 